Hello, hello, we are live. Good afternoon. Welcome to Suki's Healthy Sex Fair. I'm your host today. I'm Nancy Freeborn. I am joining you from my very professional, very lovely kitchen today. Uh, let's talk about sex today. Let's talk about healthy sex. Some people want it. Some people are having sex. Some people don't know what to do. Some people are experts. Some people think they're experts. Let's talk about all of it. Uh, this event today is to help you, uh, to help answer some questions uh, that you might have to provide you with some amazing local resources. And if you do have questions, submit them in the chat. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we will answer them if we have time, hopefully at the end. There is no such thing as a stupid question. If you don't know the answer to it, I guarantee there are other people who also don't know the answer. Maybe they're embarrassed to ask. So maybe if you ask it, you will help other people as well. So please get in that chat ask some questions of the experts that we have today. Uh, so we do have experts here to chat. Uh, they're gonna talk about some things that you need to know. First up, we're gonna start with Deanna. Deanna is from Confederation College's Pride Center. So we'll wait for her to pop up there, Deanna, whenever you're ready. There you are, and make sure to unmute your mic for us as well, please. There you are, hi, Deanna. Hi, Nancy, and hi, hi. everyone. How's it going today? I'm good, how are you? Good, good, thank you, very well. Uh, so Deanna, can you start just by telling us about the Pride Center at Confederation College? Yeah, so the Pride Center is kind of like an offshoot from another project, which is called the Art Hive. And that overall project is funded by the Ministry of Colleges and Universities. Um, and the focus of the Pride Center specifically is to create safer and welcoming spaces on campus for the 2S LGBTQIA+ population. However, while that's our target population, we are open to anyone at the college. Um, we don't restrict any access at all. Um, and we're happy to have anyone welcome anyone into the center. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Um, first, can you, Deanna, talk to us about the spectrum of sexuality? Yeah, so that's a great question. There is a wide range of sexualities within the human population. Um, and this is related to how you do or you don't experience sexual and romantic attraction and your interests regarding sexual and romantic relationships and behavior. Um, so there's many different sexualities. I can't name all of them in this context, but the most normalized one is of course heterosexuality, um, which means that a person is sexually, emotionally, and romantically uh, attracted to someone of the opposite sex or gender as themselves. 
Um, then there's homosexual, but folks might prefer words like gay or lesbian and so on. Um, which means that you're attracted to someone who is of the same sex or gender as yourself. Um, and then there's bisexual or pansexual, which are slightly different words, um, meaning that someone is attracted to people of more than one or all genders. Um, and then the one that I really wanted to talk about was asexuality, because that's often not talked about, but asexuality is a person who is not sexually attracted to anyone. Um, and oftentimes in our society, there is a huge emphasis on sex, um, which kind of leads many like people who are who identify as asexual to think that there's something wrong with them or they're broken. And that's absolutely not true. Um, it's just a variation and everyone's different and there's no wrong way to experience or not experience sex. Um, and I think it's the most important thing is to remember that everyone is the best judge of their own sexual sexuality and their own sexual experience. And we just need to remember that and respect that and let people tell us who they are and how they identify. So true. And especially when you talk about ACE uh, folks, which like you said, don't, they don't always get mentioned. Uh, and it's interesting because to my understanding, even within sort of under the ACE umbrella is quite a lot of different types of folks as well, who may, feel some sort of attraction to somebody or it, it's kind of really interesting uh, to learn about. I've had a couple of friends of mine who've been really open about educating uh, me. So yeah, it's, it's uh, really good to talk about. And, and so thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, let's just shift. Yeah. So let's just shift a little bit. Um, we'll talk about STIs for a moment here. Now, some of you folks might be used to hearing it be called STDs. Um, generally, I think now we use the term STI sort of across the board. So that's what we're talking about. Um, so what should folks know about the different forms of pr protection against STIs? Yeah, so oftentimes, again, like the main thing that gets talked about is condoms which condoms are absolutely important and essential to these conversations, but they're only one option. They're great for when you or the person you're having sex with or people you're having sex with have a penis or in the case that you're using sex toys, um, because um, by using a condom with sex toys, you can reduce the chances of uh, spreading STIs um, from one person to another. Um, and then this is also useful if individuals involved are sharing the sex toys as well. Um, but there are other options. For example, if you're having oral sex with someone with a clitoris and a vulva, you might wanna use a dental dam, which is a piece of latex or polyurethane um, that is placed over the vaginal opening to create a barrier between the mouth and genitals during oral sex. Um, and also one thing to note is that if you don't have access to a dental dam, though I did notice today as I was walking by the Sugi stop that they did have dental dams available. Um, so if you're interested, go uh, stop there. I'm not sure how long they're there, but um, um, another tip is if you don't have access to a dental dam is you can use a condom by unrolling it and then cutting off either end and then cutting this like kind of cylinder and then opening it up, and then you can place it over the vaginal opening. Um, that, and uh, and uh, I'm just hearing, uh, we have sort of a little uh, God speaking into our ear here, Sir Thomas. And so he's just mentioning that there's always uh, condoms, dental dams, et cetera, at the office, um, at the college there, the Suki office. So, and I know that they have strawberry flavored dental dams. Okay. So get into it uh, that's yeah. really interesting tip about being able to just use a condom as a dental down that's really interesting yeah especially since like if you don't immediately have it then it's a quick tip um one last thing that I did want to mention was the use of gloves um but for present preventing the spread of STIs um when using your hands to stimulate a person's genitals um such as wound fingering or fisting um uh, with gloves, they should only be used one time, of course, as with any other protection. Um, and another point is that lube can be applied to the gloves, but avoid uh, oil-based lube, especially if you are using latex-based gloves, because that can break down the latex and then deem it ineffective. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, um, you know, it's really important to use protection and you shouldn't feel uh, nervous or uncomfortable or anything like that to bring it up with a partner. If you want to use a glove, if you want to use a dental dam, if you want to use a condom, if your partner isn't comfortable with you using these things or they them using them, if you're asking them to, then, you know, you might want to rethink. Uh, they, nobody should ever sort of guilt you about that, that choice, right, to use protection. Exactly. So uh, let's go back to something that you had mentioned earlier uh, when we were talking about the spectrum of sexuality and how sort of the most normalized uh, is heteronormative uh, or heterosexual. So why is it important to move away from heteronormative expectations when we are talking about healthy sexuality? I don't know. I don't think I met you before. Yeah. Sorry, (laughs) someone just... uh... I love it. My dog might start barking at any minute. So, you know, that's just life right now. Um, Yeah, that's a great question. Um, So as I talked about earlier, there's a great amount of sexual diversity in the human population. Um, So one of the things you might have noticed, like folks might have noticed, is that when I was talking about forms of protection from SDIs, I focused more on the specific body parts. Um, than like the, than the gendered people. Um, so that's one aspect of that. Um, but also um, by moving away from those heteronormative expectations, such as the expectation that everyone is straight, um, we can make room for others who identify with a sexuality that is not straight or a gender identity that's not cisgender. Um, and this is important because it makes folks who identify as gay, bisexual, asexual, and so on, feel more welcome in these spaces and feel like their needs are being met um, rather than feeling invisible and unrepresented. Yeah, representation is definitely an an issue. And um, this sort of idea that heterosexual and cisgender is sort of the default sort of normal thing and everything else is sort of this deviation, it's just not the case. So yeah, it, it is. Representation is is good. And and uh, yeah, just moving away from that heteronormative sort of uh, focal point. Um, so in, in that same sort of uh, vein, um, can you talk about consent within relationships, but specifically consent within 2SLGBTQIA plus relationships? Yeah, so <clears throat> consent is important in all relationships, regardless of who's involved, of course. Um, And sometimes I think there can be this kind of assumption that um, to like, for example, if two women are in a relationship that it's more healthier and like more egalitarian and that's not necessarily true. Um, So it's, and then that can lead to assumptions that for example, sexual assault doesn't happen in those relationships and that's harmful and creates a lot of stigma for those people who do experience sexual assault. And there's already a lot of stigma surrounding sexual assault. So like, we don't need to add to it and um, just creating more space. Um, So with consent um, in any relationship, it should involve a conversation before engaging in any sexual activity, um, as well as checking in during sexual activity. It's not weird. You can like, the more we normalize it, the more normal it becomes. And like, we just have to keep on doing it until it becomes the new, like the new normal. Um, But one of the points that I really wanted to bring up was something that the best thing I learned about consent was actually attending an online panel where someone from the kink community was uh, on the panel. And one of the, they were part of the kink community, but also part of the 2S LGBTQ community. Um, And they told attendees that prior to engaging in any sexual behaviors, they would have an open conversation with their partners or or partner about uh, what um, everyone involved was comfortable with. And then once that conversation took place, they would not deviate from from it unless the person decided um, during that sexual act that they didn't want to do something anymore. In that case, it was stopped immediately. Um, but those conversations are so normalized in the king community. Um, and I think that's, that's a message that anyone can take. Um, and it's important to learn. 
Yeah, it's true. It, it, yeah, it, it's true. Those conversations, they do, they do tend to happen beforehand. And there's no reason that someone who's just sort of having, I guess what you could call closer to vanilla sexual experience, uh, there's no reason that they can't have that conversation either. And like you said, the important thing is that consent can change at any time. So we need to be listening to our partners um, and, and speaking our minds as well. And like you said, it isn't weird, even if it is during the act. You know, if you just sort of move your hand to a spot and go, is this okay? Can I do this? Are you okay with this? And also listening. If you go to do something and they go, "Mm -mm," or they pull your hand away, respect that. And if they've agreed to have sex with you and while you're having sex, they say, you know, I'm not feeling it. I'm feeling upset or whatever it is, or they seem like they are not into it. It's a good idea to stop what you're doing. Check in with your partner. Are you okay? Do you need a minute? So listening to each other really and uh and being open yeah consent can change at any time uh so uh lastly what are some inclusive sexual health resources that students can access while they're in thunder bay yeah so one of the really great resources that i've found in thunder bay in the past few years is the umbrella clinic um they're a great um inclusive and welcoming kit uh clinic um and they provide access to care that is inclusive to everyone and also addresses the gaps that are in health care for gender and sexual diverse individuals. Um, this is especially important for trans folks um, who might be looking to in, like looking into their options regarding medical transition if that's for them um, because the umbrella clinic can provide um, referrals and also pr- provide prescriptions and administration of hormone replacement therapy, which is very important, especially in Thunder Bay, where um, those resources are limited for trans folks. Um, another one, of course, we have the Thunder Bay Sexual Health Clinic, which is um, going to be here <laughs> anyway, so I won't talk much about that. But also, um, I have a few Instagram resources. Um, since a lot of people find that helpful. Um, so I'll, I don't know if it will work to just copy and paste into the chat, um, but I have a few. Yeah, okay, so you that's know, great. Yeah, so Thomas was just saying, so that I know that our audience can't hear Thomas. That's why I was calling up sort, sort of our God that we can hear in our heads. Um, he's just saying to send them to him and that he will post them after. Um, so if you folks are looking for that information from Deanna, you can get that in the chat. You can get that from Thomas at the, the Suki office there at any time. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Deanna. If you have some questions about the spectrum of sexuality or anything else that you'd like to ask Deanna, post them in the comments, post them in the chat. Uh, we will get uh, Deanna to answer some questions at the end. So thank you so much, Deanna. And we'll talk to you a little later uh, in the day here. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so our next guest is Areti. And Areti is from the Sexual Health Clinic at the Thunder Bay District Health Unit. So we'll wait for her to pop up there. There she is. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Unmuted. <laughs> How's it going today, Areti? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm awesome. Thank you so Great. much. Yeah. Um, so thank you for coming. So let's start sort of how we started with Deanna. If you can uh, just tell us a bit about the sexual health clinic. So like Nancy said, my name is already, I am one of the public health nurses at the Thunder Bay district health unit in the sexual health program. So the sexual health program at the, at the health unit, what we do is we promote and celebrate healthy sexuality. Um, this includes, you know, understanding the possible consequences of sex, including pregnancy and also contracting a sexually transmitted infection and how to protect yourself against those risks by practicing safe sex. So for those individuals who don't know, sexually transmitted infections are um, infections that you can get through any unprotected sex. And our clinic offers, you know, birth control, including uh, emergency contraception. Uh, We also offer pregnancy testing option and routine STI testing. So if you ever have any questions or any concerns, you're welcome to visit us or give us a call and we can definitely chat with you. Awesome. And I know from personal experience that all of the folks that work there, I mean, the place is very inclusive. People are so warm and welcoming. I've never felt judged, you know, going in for any type of testing and like telling my story or whatever it is that no one has ever, you know, made me feel judged or anything like that. I feel very comfortable there. And so it is a really great place that we do have in Thunder Bay, a great resource. Uh, Absolutely. 
So we'll we'll talk first about everybody's favorite thing, which is pap testing. Yeah. Uh, so my first question about that is, when should pap testing be completed? Okay, so what I'll start off with is a lot of individuals actually do not know what a pap test is. So what a pap test is, it's a um, it's an exam, it's a cervical, um, a vaginal or pelvic exam that's completed to um, assess the cervix and screen for cervical cancer. So in Ontario, the rates of cervical cancer has been going up. So the recommendations is that individuals starts to screen at age 21. However, because of the pandemic, that recommendation has been changed by the Ontario Service cervical screening um, program to the age of 25. So even if you are 21 and you come to us and you need a pap test, we'll gladly do one for you. Okay. But yeah, so pap testing should be completed at age 25. So give us a call if you ever want to make an appointment or if you have a question about it. Yeah. And again, it's, you know what, it's really normal for the folks that work there. Don't feel weird or embarrassed to go get a pap. They don't care. Exactly. They see it all day long. They're not going to remember you. They're not going to think anything about you is unusual. So please just go have the pap. It's really important. If you catch something early, you'll be so glad that you did it. It, it is absolutely worth it. Try to go on the same day as a friend or, or for moral support, have them wait in the car. Uh, but it's something that, uh, that we all should be doing. Um, so let's talk for a moment about HIV. So I have heard recently that HIV research has actually advanced quite a bit. So what services do you have for HIV at the clinic? So I'll start again with what HIV is because HIV can, you know, be confused with other infections as well. So first of all, HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus, and it's a virus that attacks your body's immune system, and it can be passed along from person to person through direct contact with either blood, uh, either with blood or other bodily fluids, like sharing um, equipment for drug use or getting a tattoo or piercing with <laughs> unsterilized equipment. Um, if HIV is left untreated, it can develop into AIDS, okay? So although HIV is also not curable, like um, N Nancy said, you know, HIV research has been advanced. So now, although it's not curable, it is treatable and individuals are, li are living very healthy lives with the medication. So as long as you're staying on your treatment, you're able to live a healthy life. And at the sexual health clinic at the health unit, we offer free HIV testing. And this includes anonymous HIV testing, counseling, treatment options, and also referral to like, you know, the community, uh, other community agencies who can further help support. Yeah. So, and again, it's, it's a good idea to just go and get tested. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I always think, you know, um, after you've been or before you're going to be with a new partner is always a really great time to yes. do that. Or, you know what, if you found yourself in a one night stand situation, it happens to all of us, you know what, call the health unit, go for a, you know, a, a once over, get tested for everything. You're going to feel so good that you did that either way. Cause you'll, you'll have answers either way. So it is important um, to go and do that. And again, they're, they're not judging you over there. Not so <laughs> um, so uh, another question that I have for you uh, is about health cards. So if someone doesn't have a health card, do they have to pay for the testing? You do not have to have a health card to attend an appointment at the sexual health clinic at the health unit. However, as a college student, most international students will have something called a UHIP. So you're welcome to bring that with you to your appointment, but you do not need a health card. You can just come on in and we will register you um, and then we'll give you your results if you're requesting your results. But you do not need a health card or any coverage. We will not send you a bill. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, so uh, just talking again about uh, STIs. So if I wanted to read more about sort of STIs in general, are there any resources that you yourself would recommend? Absolutely. There are some fantastic resources out there. And one of my favorite uh, resources, apart from our website, it's a website called sexinyou.ca. And I will also send that link and it can be shared um, by the student union. Uh, so Sexin has all information on all different types of sexually transmitted infections, um, including bloodborne infections like HIV, hepatitis, syphilis, you name it. They have everything. If you have any questions about birth control, it's sort of the one site that has all the information you could be looking for. So I definitely recommend taking a look at that website, um, educate yourself and your partner, um, you know, before you engage in any, in any sexual activity. So I'll definitely send that website across. That's great. It looks like we're going to have some pretty awesome resources afterwards. Uh, I do have one more question for you. 
kind of going back to what we were already sort of talking about. So should folks get tested if they have no symptoms? Okay. So not all individuals who have an STI will have symptoms. So we definitely recommend uh, routine testing before having sex with a new partner every three to six months, or if you had multiple partners in the past, or if you've been exposed to a partner who tested positive for an STI. We also recommend, you know, make sure you're using protective barriers like a condom or a dental dam. Uh, Suki does offer those um, on campus. The health unit also offers them for free. Uh, you don't need to make an appointment for those. Feel free to walk into the building. They're in a basket. Grab as many as you want. So just ensure you're getting routine testing just to know where you're at. And we recommend that everybody's, you know, taking care of their health and their sexuality. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. You're ready. Uh, so we will go back to uh, De Deanna again. So if you folks have questions for Ready, please drop them in the chat. We're going to pop her back up after and uh, she can answer those questions for you. Thank you so much. Uh, so Deanna, if you want to come back and join us and make sure you unmute. Beautiful. Uh, so Deanna from Pride Center is just going to be telling us a bit about the services offered by Confederation Colleges Health Center. So go ahead, Deanna. Thank you. Yeah, so the health center offers various services, but the common concerns that they um, focus on um, for the student population are typically concerns regarding testing for sexually transmitted infections. They're able to test and free all STIs. Um, another one is possible uh, testing for possible pregnancy. They may discuss uh, potential options for the pregnancy, both regarding termination as well as referral for obstetrical care. Um, another service that they offer is uh, initiating birth control and refilling um, existing birth control medications um, depending on what each individual wants. There's so many different birth controls out there. So um, it's important to discuss um, exactly what is right for each individual. Um, and then um, they also offer PAP examinations as well as uh, potentially referrals to specialists or other clinics if there are remarkable results. Um, and then when in cases of sexual assault, they will do a physical assessment and support and then referral for fur further management and care if necessary. Um, and then also, uh, like everyone else here, um, they also offer free condoms. <laughs> that's great so it sounds like that's actually a really good resource there that confederation college health center wow um so is there is there cost for any of the testing at the clinic or no so all tests for stis are completely free um just come as you are if you're a student um you don't have to pay anything there's no bill that's that's awesome and so are all of the services confidential Yes, just like any medical information, any use of services is confidential and will not be shared with anyone else. So Deanna, if I was a student at the college and I had a sexual partner that is not a student at the college, can I bring my partner in if they do not attend the college? Yes, absolutely. Um, as many people, for many people, bringing another person can be a source of comfort. And as long as you want them to be there, the, this will be permitted. Um, and uh, of course, with COVID, um, that person would have to follow protocols just as anyone else. But of course, they could be there. Sure. Oh, I love that. that that's great. Um, how long does the STI, how long do the STI results take? Typically, it will take about one week. Um, however, depending on the case, it's determined on case. Just breaking sooner, up a little bit. Um, just based on but, sorry uh Deanna you're breaking up just a little bit there can you go back and uh, and just let us know again how long the STI results take yeah so it takes about one week um but sometimes treatment will be initiated um sooner than that just on a case-to-case -case basis okay um now here's my question let's say I'm a college student I come there I get tested and I do test positive for an STI do I have to inform sexual partners if I'm positive for an STI infection? We're losing you a little bit there again, Deanna. Let's give it a second and see if you if you catch up there. Yeah, you're breaking up for me. Oh, yeah. 
let's uh, yeah let's bring uh already if you don't mind if you want to pop back in because i was going to get you both back Absolutely. up here yes <laughs> thanks already do you mind asking that question for us so if i come in i get tested i'm positive do i have to inform my sexual partners that i'm positive for an sti so for uh sexually transmitted infections some of them are reportable infections so those so reportable means you do have to tell your partner that you have tested positive uh so for example chlamydia gonorrhea something like hiv syphilis hepatitis you do have to complete something called partner notification so informing your partner and the reason we do this is that way they have the chance to get tested and get treated as well however if there's ever any concerns of safety or you just don't feel comfortable letting your partner know at the health unit we're glad to help you do that anonymously so that means we don't tell your partner what your name is or who they got it from or anything like that and we would complete partner notification on your behalf for you wow that's huge that's that's huge yeah that's a really good way to make sure that everyone stays safe and yeah i mean that that would be the fear right that you're gonna have to go and like tell this person that this happened so the fact that you folks will support someone through that and actually do it for them i mean that's huge yes. um so I do have a few more questions here. So uh, first, I want to just thank you both so much for being here, for answering these questions for us. Um, so if Deanna, we can try and see if she, if they want to come back, we'll see. Are you back? I think it's good now, um, Okay, I think but my so. connection tends to be a little bit unstable. I mean, this is this is the times, right? We, it's unpredictable. Uh, so just a few questions. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just kind of pose the question and if either one of you just want to kind of jump in and take it, if not, then I'll just, I'll uh, pick on one of you basically. <laughs> um, so these are kind of more casual kind of questions. So uh, the first one is, what do I do if my partner asks me to do something I don't want to do sexually? Well, I think this can come back to the whole thing about having that conversation with your partner, um, letting them know that what your boundaries are, that you're not comfortable, and um, just enforcing those boundaries, um, because they're important, and you should feel comfortable in, in the sexual activity that you yeah, so we're losing Deanna a little bit there again. She's just sort of breaking up. Uh, but I think I understand sort of the gist of what you're saying is just like what we were talking about earlier. If somebody asks you to do something that you're not comfortable doing sexually, you do not have to do it. And you know what? You don't even have to be that forceful about it. No, thank you. Removing yourself from the situation. Maybe another time. Let me think about it. Uh, and the person that you're talking to should respect that. If they are not going, okay, yeah, no problem then that is a huge problem that that is someone you should rethink, um, you know, exploring this sort of thing with because people should respect that. Absolutely. Um, so here's another question. Maybe you're ready if you want to take this one. So this one says, my partner and I have different sex drives and they want sex more than I do, but I feel guilty for saying no. What should I do? Okay. So first of all, do not feel guilty to say no, you know, it is your body, okay? And just like we talked about in previous conversations and questions, dialogue is very, very important in like, you know, between two sexual partners. So just ensuring before you're engaging in any sexual activity, you're both having that conversation about what you're comfortable with. If you're not comfortable having sex, you know, make sure you're voicing your opinion. If there's ever any issues with consent and the other person is not understanding, then like Nancy said, you know, rethink that decision. If at any time you feel like you need to reach out to further resources like mental health resources or just talk to a counselor about, you know, these issues that you may be dealing with, definitely seek those out. I know Confederation College has those available um, on campus. And like I said, you're welcome to call the health unit at any time if you want to chat, but never feel pressured to engage in any sexual activity you do not want to. Yeah. And I think it's just sort of how we were talking earlier about how consent can change even just throughout a sexual act, it can also change throughout a relationship. Just because you are in a relationship with somebody does not mean you have consented to have sex with them every single time they want. Exactly, so yep. it, it's still okay to say no. And yeah, maybe a conversation beforehand about maybe there's a compromise in there. You know what? I, I don't really feel like having sex. Can we cuddle? Is that okay? Would you be comfortable? Maybe I'll give you a back rub. We can sort of be affectionate in another way and just finding something that works. Um, 
so here's another question I think already that you you would probably be able to answer. I think we might have lost Deanna. Well, hopefully they'll try and come back. But um, so this question says, I don't feel right in my body and I think I might be trans. My mom is trying to be supportive, but keeps pressuring me to come out to her. What should I do? That is, you know, I completely understand that question and that it's tough when it's your mom, you know, pressuring you, but also being supportive. Um, you know, if you feel like you may be trans and you want to seek out those resources, there's a resource on campus. Uh, there's also Umbrella Clinic in Thunder Bay who, um, you know, has these resources to support uh, trans individual across the spectrum. So, you know, definitely seeking out those resources, but do not let your mom pressure you. If you're not comfortable yet or, you know, feel ready to come out and have that conversation, you do not have to. Um, or you may even want to have that conversation with your mom and tell her, you know what, mom? I'm just not at that point here where I feel like I can discuss it with you, but I'll let you know when I'm ready to come out. So that's like a good starting point, but don't feel pressured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Because the folks in your life are going to be processing it and they may, they may have different ways of processing it yeah. and they may not necessarily be a harmful way or intentionally harmful, mm -hmm. but it's still about your comfort level, where you're at, if you're ready, if you're not. So exactly communication, like mom, I, I, I get it. <laughs> I know yeah. you're processing, but I need to get there in my own time and, and I'll be ready when I'm ready. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so here's a question that we can try and see. I don't know if Deanna, if you think that we can, <laughs> we could try or you seem pretty, pretty smooth now. Um, so the question I'll pose. Um, so this says, I have been sexually active and have never been tested. I have no symptoms or anything. Should I get tested? We'll see if we can get to yeah Anna. so hopefully i'm back now um yeah but like yeah so as already said earlier um it's important to get tested before an, a new sexual partner um especially i think i believe she said uh every three months um so regardless of if you're experiencing symptoms or not it's it's always better to just be safe and catch it earlier um because the later you catch it the worse the symptoms can get and the harder it is to treat so sooner is better so just it's better to err on the safe side exactly because sooner or later you may end up with an issue and you're going to have to go in anyway <laughs> so you might as well go in get it over with do the thing we all have to do it um and again no, nobody there is judging you and the other people in the waiting room like they're not judging you either we're all there for our own reasons okay uh, so here's the last the last question um, it says, what if I've never been sexually active and I don't know what I like, what can I do? So I don't seem like amateur hour my first time <laughs> already. If you want to touch on that. Sorry, I had to unmute myself there, but yes, yes. I can take that question. Um, if you've never been sexually active, that's okay to start off with. My first recommendation is get educated. That's very important before any sexual encounter you have with anyone. So I, like I said, I will send the previous website, Sexing You. Go on that website, get some information about, apart from STIs, um, you know, just, you know, arousal and how to have sex and how to have that conversation and dialogue. So I would start with, you know, the dialogue and the education and then, you know, so if you don't want to seem like an amateur, start by having that conversation as well, you know, start by, you know, is this okay with you? Can I touch you? Or, you know, um, can I give you a back rub or something? So start slow. You don't have to start fasting, you know, um, just go right in. Just take your time. Take your time. Have that conversation. Um, be with a partner who you're comfortable, you know, engaging in that activity with. Absolutely. Because a lot of it is really about exploring each other's bodies and, and yes. communicating and this sort of thing. And uh, the other thing is, it, it doesn't really matter if you see sort of amateur hour, if you're with a partner, not who's not judgmental, like they want to be with you, they want to hook up, right? So it's yeah. like, it's okay, no one should be judgmental about that, especially if they know it's your first time, they're not going to expect, like, they just want to be with you and explore and have each other, you know, explore each other. So uh, the other thing, just the, the first part of that question mentioning, uh, not knowing what I like, there's always masturbation. If that's something that you're comfortable with, even if you're not maybe exploring it um, to see if there is a way that you can find a comfort level there. Masturbation is a great way to find out what you like. And when you're with a partner, it is not weird to tell your partner what you like. If they are over here and you want them over here, tell them, 
take their hand and move it there. You'll know what you're, what you like. So you'll be able to sort of guide them. Um, so, uh, thank you so much already. And thank you so much, Deanna. Deanna, we lost you a little at the end, but we got some really, really great information, uh, and answers and resources from you there and you as well already. Thank you so much. We're very appreciative of that. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, so just to sort of wrap up here, this week is Healthy Sexuality Week at Confederation College, and Suki has some fun events coming up over the next two days. So first off, uh, you can join us in the Ryan Hall cafeteria in the Shunya building or online via Zoom on Thursday, October 15th. So that's this Thursday coming up in the evening from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. for Sex Toy Bingo. Yes, you heard me right. Sex toy bingo. If you have not played Suki's sex toy bingo, it is so fun. Absolutely hilarious. It's informative. Uh, it, it's just a really good time. And we are giving away adult toys. Yes, sex toys. Exactly what you're thinking. Also some gift cards and more. You can actually play bingo online or in person and you can win the prizes. So that's awesome. Uh, now you do have to be 18 or older to win the actual toys. But don't worry, we do have prizes for folks who are under 18. So you can still play it. You can still win some awesome prizes like gift cards. Now, the only thing is you must be a college student to play. So you can win big. As I said, you can also get some healthy sex tips. You can learn some stuff uh, from your friends at Suki, your student association. And then it's Consent Friday. And yes, they spelled it like French fry, okay? Consent Friday. Visit the Ryan Hall McIntyre or Ace cafeterias and get some free French fries and some info about consent. So that's this Friday between 11:30 a.m. and 1 p.m. It says while supplies last. I don't know. And now that I know there's French fries over there, I might be coming in there. So get in there quick. Get the get the French fries while supplies last. And you know what? All students are welcome. So I just want to say thank you so much to everybody today. Thank you to the folks that uh, kind of zoomed in and listened to us chat today. I hope that you learned something. Um, as always, you know, Suki is there for you. Thomas is there for you. If you have questions after you were too nervous to type them in or anything like that, there are folks there at the college that you can talk to. And there's also these two wonderful places that these two ladies are from that you can go to or call anytime and they are there to help you. So watch the comments for some info from our friends at the Umbrella Clinic and also from Diana. Yeah, also Deanna and Aredi and from Elevate uh, Northwestern Ontario as well, which is an awesome organization. Love Elevate NWO. And thank you so much again for listening. Have a safe day. Stay healthy. Stay sexy if that's your thing. And just have an awesome day. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody.